welcome Joel Westfall and General Mattis to our virtual stage to discuss call sign chaos. Jim, nice to see you again. It's good to see you again, Joel, someone I served with. And Brooke, thank you for the introduction. Good to be here with all of you. Thank you for uh, agreeing to talk with us about your book. Um, and just so everybody is aware that I, I, I did work for General Mattis at CENTCOM from 2010 <clears throat> till I left in 13. I do wanna talk a little bit about how, uh, how tonight's program will run. Um, I will start out asking some questions about the book and about leadership uh, to uh, General Mattis. Uh, and while that is going on, uh, please be sure to type in your questions and uh, we will get to those in the later uh, part of the program. Uh, we can't promise we're gonna get to everyone's question, but we're gonna do our, our very best uh, to answer a, a quite a few questions from the audience tonight. Um, so, uh, let's begin. Um, my first question, uh, again, uh, talking about leadership here, because the book is titled um, Call Sign Chaos, and again, Learning to Lead, uh, and that's really what, what I want to focus on first, is the, the leadership aspect and, and learning about leadership in your book. Um, you, you bring up the importance Early on in the book, you bring up the importance of the three C's in leadership, and those are competency, caring, and conviction. If we can, let's focus on the caring aspect of leadership. Now, myself as a young leader, it was probably the hardest for me to get early on. And in fact, if it wasn't for two colonels at CENCOM, I still probably would be getting it wrong. Um, my question is, is, how does one maintain a social and personal distance, but still come across as caring? Well, Joel, it's a great question, and I, I thank all of you who keep President Ford's legacy of leadership alive, because if you want to see caring in action, and at the same time see competence and conviction, uh, it all summed up in one man, I think uh, you, you see it right there in that all-American president we had out of the heartland. You know, I was, <clears throat> I was brought up in the infantry, in the, in the Marines. And we're all the products of our formative experiences. And I was taught as a very young officer by the old time NCOs who'd been everywhere, done all that. They said, you know, Lieutenant, uh, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that kind of set the tone going forward. Remember the infantry got their name, infant soldier, young soldier. That's how they got their name. The majority of the troops in your infantry platoon and 40 sailors and Marines, uh, your infantry company uh, are not old enough. 70% uh, of them can't go out and buy a beer or cigarettes legally in the state of Michigan. Uh, it just reminds you that for many of these young folks, especially today, uh, oftentimes you're in a role of loco parentis. And sometimes, unless they've played sports, it may even be uh, the first adults that really took a hand in coaching them. <clears throat> and so I, I, the point I would make here goes back to a song, you have to be as old as me probably to remember it, by Crosby, Stills, and Nash. I mean, you have to listen on NPR anymore to hear this song play. That's old. And, uh, but they had a line in one of the, their songs said, you, when you're on the road, must have a code you can live by. And if your code as a leader doesn't involve what Jerry Ford demonstrated every day, which was put others first, then they are not going to care as much about how much you know and your brilliant tactics and that sort of thing, because they're never going to be quite sure of what their linkage is to you. And in the military, where, uh, where competence is absolutely a moral requirement because you, you pay the price of incompetence, oftentimes by putting lads into body bags, uh, when you've got to have conviction, because the last thing the troops need when the chips are down is an uncertain leader. But it's the caring that really, I think, keeps people together. And in my line of work, I thought being a player coach was the right model for a leader, a player coach. And I can't show you any team that wins that doesn't have a coach that cares about them, cares about them for more than just how many points they made 
in last Saturday's game. So you put the competence together with something called empathy. And empathy is not some soft touch. Empathy gives people hope. And when you're a leader, you'd better be able to lead competently and give people hope because you're going to careen from one crisis to another. So that's kind of where I come from on the, on the uh, Karen about your troops, uh, Joel. Yeah, some of the best leaders I've ever worked for when you entered the room, uh, it was they made you feel you were the most important person in the room rather mm -hmm. than they were. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which kind of leads <laughs> me into my next question. Um, and that is the kind of one of the major pitfalls of leadership. And that's, uh, that's ego. Um, when we look at, for example, other, le other leaders who had large egos, like a General Patton, a MacArthur, and we compare those with a, maybe an Eisenhower or a Marshall, um, what can we take away from these kind of different leadership styles? And why is ego such a danger to successful leadership? Yeah, I mean, you're going to the very heart of leadership, uh, I think, with that question, Joel. It is a major pitfall. Uh, I call it big guy-itis. You start thinking that you're the big guy here. You're not the servant leader. You're not leading free men and women. You're becoming a dictator. And uh, it's, it's like you start drinking your own whiskey, to put it in rather irreverent terms. And I, I think that uh, one thing, one way it was brought home to me, I was, I, as you mentioned, uh, or as uh, Brooke mentioned, I, I teach you know, on various college campuses. I'm down at Stanford University. And I was asked in one of the classes where I was asked about how do you coach people? Because that's so important for a leader. Who would I not coach? And it was without ever being asked the question before it jumped right out that I will not waste my time coaching someone who is arrogant. If they don't have humility, then number one, they're going to be a toxic leader. Number two, you might as well be pouring water into a bottomless bucket. It's not going to stick. They already know it all. So I'll try one time with someone like that, a guy or gal who thinks they know it all. And then I'll just decide I'm going to go talk to somebody, some young folks who I can pass on some of the lessons I learned the hard way. Mm -hmm. um, success is, is what breeds this though, Joel. And that's what's so difficult because as you go up in rank, I was always vaguely surprised every time I got promoted, uh, a little bit surprised by it because I, I managed to get into a bunch of scrapes at nearly every rank, all but one. And so what you have to do is guard against this sense that surprise is validating everything about you. Success can be the biggest poison to your own personal character development. How do you fight it? I, by the time I was a four-star general, you won't believe, but you were probably the closest thing to God on earth in terms of people doing what you say when you're a four-star general. You saw that at Central Command. I mean, even when you tell stupid jokes, people laugh. You know what I mean? That shows yeah. that you've kind of gotten up a little big. Uh, so I kept two people with me. You'll remember them, Joel, a Navy captain, <clears throat> a, a sea dog. He'd been all around the world, uh, a tough guy. Uh, and an army sergeant major, ranger, uh, call sign, his call sign was hurricane for a reason. And those two guys did not give a damn what I thought of them. They could have cared less. If they thought I messed up, they'd go into my office and close the door. They maintained proper military courtesy and all that, but they let me know. So you've got to keep people around you who are going to let you know when you're starting to act, get a little case of big guy-itis, or you're going off the wrong way. Well, I think that's uh, that's great advice for for a, a new young leader out there is to to stay away from stay away from that pitfall. Um, another, I think, important aspect of leadership is this, this next one I'm going to talk about, and you and you stress a lot about this in your book. Um, but in your own words, um, how important is it that a leader be well read? Oh, I, I consider it critical. Um, you, again, you don't live long enough to learn all the lessons that history can teach you. <clears throat> I mean, uh, their acting director, Brooke, she, she's got a degree in history. You should always keep someone like that close by. Uh, and you've got to do your own homework. You can't contract out your thinking. So I would just say naval leaders, I was in the Marines, like Jerry Ford was in the, was in the Navy. But naval leadership really is just careening from one crisis to the next. 
So what reading does, it gives you a mental model about how other people dealt with similar problems, not the same problem, every problem's unique, I got that, but they dealt with similar problems either successfully or unsuccessfully. And I think that we all need those kinds of mental models. I didn't realize until I was really quite senior in the Marines why the Commandant of the Marine Corps has a required reading list. And all privates and second lieutenants have to read these six books. When you make corporal or sergeant or you make captain, here's another dozen books. Every time you, you make walk. general and you got to do it. And the reason is they're training you to shoot rifles, to communicate on radios, to fly airplanes for things they know you have to do. But they're educating you for the things they cannot anticipate. And in crisis, this always happens. And so I'll give you the example. After 9-11, uh, a three-star admiral calls me a one-star Marine in. He's the fleet commander. And he explained that the enemy in northern Afghanistan was being beaten up pretty badly by the Green Berets and the Northern Alliance and the CIA guys. And they were falling back on Kabul. He'd read his history, Joel, and he said, and no one has ever held Kabul in 500 years. They're going to continue falling back on Kandahar, getting stronger in Kandahar. And then he asked me, can you get the Marines together from the Mediterranean fleet and the Pacific fleet and land in southern Afghanistan and move against Kabul or against Kandahar? I said, yes, I can do that. So he gave me an airplane, an anti-submarine plane. I went up and I circled that night over Afghanistan for about eight hours looking down. And now I'm going to tell you, Joel, how to make four-star general. <laughs> Fight enemy generals who are dumber than a bucket of rocks. Because of all my reading, I could see the fighting up north. I could see some fighting off to the east. And then I saw this big dark area south of Kandahar. And I didn't care how brave his boys were. I didn't care how many tanks he had. I knew exactly how I was going to ruin his day. And there wasn't a thing he was going to be able to do about it. As long as I had the Navy and the Marines that could get my guys 350 nautical miles in. I said that with that confidence because of my study, because of my reading. So yeah, it, it's irreplaceable in terms of your own development and it's critical. The truth below you are trusting that you've done your homework when you're gonna get 10 them in on helicopters, 250 nautical miles from the sea in the middle of the night, refueling over the mountains. They're counting on you to have done your homework. Yeah, I remember that story from the uh, from the book. Uh, it, it's, a good, it's a good one. I uh, appreciate you sharing that with, uh, with our, our viewers. <clears throat> Uh, another another interesting story you tell in your in the book is is kind of your upbringing, um, and I'll be honest, you know, I've met you about met you met you a couple of times down in at Sencom, but I was not aware that, that you were kind of a little bit of a rapscallion in your youth, um, and during that time when you were young, someone gave you a break, um, which did not negatively impact you in your life or in the Marine Corps career. Uh, looking back, uh, how important was the decision by that local judge? to not let that kind of single mistake define you? And how has that carried you through your life and your leadership style? Yeah, I, I think in many ways, America was a little more forgiving a place, a little more trusting a place. I hitchhiked all over the American West as a teenager. <clears throat> and I was on active duty in the Marines by the time I was 21. Uh, I'd been in jail a couple of times, gotten into some fights and that sort of thing. But it wasn't it really wasn't uh, a lot of ethical things. It was just, you know, having, having a, a bit too much fun at times. Um, and, and the judge did teach me a lesson. I had an army officer come out from Fort Leavenworth. He was going through command and staff college, come out to Stanford. He said, do you know you made mistakes? You got in trouble at every rank except one. You got a letter of admonition or a, 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 you know, a, a cautioning or a negative fitness report. And I was a little irritated that I'd missed one of those ranks, wondering what had gone wrong. But uh, what did the Marine Corps do every time I made those mistakes? Uh, again, they weren't, they weren't matters of ethics. Uh, they promoted me. They saw that I was learning what right looked like by learning through mistakes at times. And I would just point out that for all leaders, a critical, a critical point I learned from what the judge did with me and from my own time on active duty was you had to be able to distinguish the difference between a mistake uh, and a lack of discipline. And if it was a mistake made as you try to do the right thing, or if you're real young and you just got into a little, little scrape, 
uh, that's a lot different. Uh, in the Catholic Church, they call it venal sins or mortal sins. I mean, let's not be shutting down everybody. For one thing, the two qualities I was looking for in my petty officers and NCOs in the, in the Navy and the Marines was initiative and aggressiveness. Well, guess what? Once in a while, uh, cocky young lads who are physically fit, uh, their initiative and aggressiveness, they can make a mistake. But institutions get the behavior they reward. We needed to reward that on the battlefield. And you can't suddenly turn it on if you haven't before. So learning the difference between a, a mistake and, and a, a really bad thing, I think is critical for any leader. If it's a mistake, then coach them better. I'll give you an example. I managed to get my battalion surrounded in the middle of an open desert. Now that's almost impossible. I mean, at, at that point, you know you're not von Clausewitz or one of those dead German guys. You really blew it. And because it was a flat open desert, my regimental commander watching me as the battalion commander saw the whole thing unfold. And here I've got four mortar teams pointing their mortars north and four pointing them south in the middle of the open desert. Later that day, he called all the battalion commanders up. We had to get ready to attack in uh, before dark. Uh, there was a hurry up attack. As we turned to go back after getting our orders, turned to go back to our units, he uh, called me over. He said, Jim, come here. He said, you learn anything today? I said, yes, sir. Now he watched the whole thing. He said, good. And Tron walked off. No long lecture, no chewing me out. I've learned the lesson and it never should have happened. So, I mean, remember, we're all coaching each other to get through this world. And whether you're a parent or a school teacher, you're running a corporation or a, you know, anything, anything that you're, you're doing, you're there to coach others and to catch them every time they do something right and coach them to keep on going. And if they did something that wasn't right, then coach them to do better. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a great Great, and I really, really appreciate that uh, that comment about the about that. Um, so, your book is called Call Sign Chaos, and uh, in the book, you share how you got the nickname Chaos. Um, but when I worked under your command, I, I didn't know you was that. Um, I was a civilian rather than in the, in, the, in serving in military in, in the military. Uh, I knew you more as uh, the warrior monk. People who I knew called you the warrior monk. Now, I'm not sure. How many other uh, Marine Corps generals uh, cite folks like uh, Marcus Aurelius and Cornelius Sullis, uh, Sulla like you do? Um, but that for me always seemed to fit more. Do you have a preference about the nicknames? Um, would you care to share how you kind of came by these nicknames for our viewers? Well, Warrior Monk, uh, that had to happen uh, on a slow news day because the only way you'd find me in a monastery is if there was beer and women. Uh, there, because I consider American women to represent all the best of America, and I, I refuse to look at a world where I'd be in a monastery. So warrior monk, I mean, I, uh, I, I wasn't always the most disciplined doing my reading either until the Marine Corps started making me sit in the BOQ room all weekend until I delivered a, bit, a book report on one. But I, I got in. I got in step with the Marine Corps. They don't. They're not like Burger King. You don't get to have it your way. You know. You you got to do it their way. But uh, the the call sign I, that stuck with me, uh, frankly, um, Joel was, was uh, chaos because when I was a colonel commanding a regiment in the Mojave Desert, I had a rather uh, witty, but in a very dry humor sort of way, Brooklyn bred Marine operations officer, and I. I would rush down to his office on a routine basis with another great idea. Uh, I knew it was a great idea because it was mine. Uh, and I'd go down to see him. And I, I uh, one time I went down to see him and I was explaining my latest, greatest idea. And I noticed as I turned to walk out of his office, having carried out my mission to myself, uh, chaos on his whiteboard. And I said, what's that about? And he said, oh, don't worry about that. You, you don't need to know about that. So yeah, oh well, yes, I do. You know. And, so eventually I waterboarded him and got it out of him. Uh, it, it was, uh, Colonel has another outstanding suggestion. Uh, it was tongue in cheek by my irreverent subordinates uh, who were not always as convinced that my ideas were as brilliant as I thought they were. But I thought it was so good, I just hung on to that one. So that's the one I've used uh, for, for many, many years, uh, Joel, since the mid nineties. Great, thank you, thank you. 
So let's let's move on to um, uh, talk about Iraq um, uh, just a little bit now. Um, uh, there's a story that you talk about in the in the book, and I, I don't really want to spoil it too much for the reader. Um, but did you ever figure out why that operational pause was initiated during the Iraq invasion? Now, uh, for all of you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, basically about halfway uh, in the attack into Iraq, halfway to Baghdad, we were put into a pause. Uh, the uh, supply lines were being hit a bit behind us uh, by bypassed units. And in the Marines, we that wasn't a big concern. Number one, we anticipated it. And in the Marines, every Marine's a rifleman. So we just told the logistics troops, you fight your way by, but keep the fuel and ammunition, the batteries, the medical supplies rolling forward. Um, but I, you know what happens, I think, um, Joel, is when the, the initial reports came in, you know, about, you know, these, these hit and run raids and these other things going on to the supply lines, initial reports I've learned in any crisis, and a crisis is something that you don't anticipate, and you're not in control of that defines a crisis. Um, the initial reports, about half of them are wrong; the other half are incorrect. You know, I mean, there, there's always uh, there's always a lot of question there. Now, one thing about combat, uh, especially for those who are going in their first time, <clears throat> it really scrapes the veneer off, and you can become very quickly subject to all your concerns and and questions. Um, you know, things can be going great and all of a sudden you see flares going off behind you and gunfire behind you and that can get your attention pretty fast. So I think it was, I think it was more just the sense of something that was unexpected, Joel. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we are in the Navy too, I think we're fortunate. The Navy of Gerald Ford and the Navy of today is less concerned about its flanks. It sees itself always moving Make the enemy, make your adversary worry about their flanks if you keep moving. So the Marines being a naval force, even if you're a couple hundred miles inland at that point, uh, it was uh, it was a little frustrating for us, frankly. Uh, but uh, we we got through it. Yeah. Thank you. One one of the things I really really liked about the about the book is is oftentimes I I felt like I was reading. Um, you know, a, a division commander at war kind of synopsis of, of the Iraq campaign. A lot of things that I really, I myself really didn't, didn't even know. And one of, the, one of the topics you talk about in the book um, is the big challenge faced by your division uh, in, in Iraq and the uh, single road. And you, you specifically talk about that single road. And when you mention that, I'm, I'm thinking back to my military history, World War II historian, um, about 30 Corps during the Arnhem, oper uh, Arnhem op operation in, in Holland. Um, and now while Iraq and Holland are not entirely similar, um, you know, that single road kind of hit me. Um, so how were you able to kind of overcome and adapt that, to that single road challenge that you talk about? Yeah, well, one, one thing you always want to do if you have an organization like the Marine Corps that's rewarded initiative, I had three assault regiments and I had to find another road. And one night, an Air Force J-STARS airplane, all that does is it shows movement, vehicles moving on the ground, okay? But one night, uh, we were dealing with this problem of only a single road in a very marshy area. As you know, Mesopotamia, Iraq is known as the land between the rivers. And guess what? The land between the rivers is pretty marshy too. You can't swim in it, but you certainly can't, and you can't plow it. It's kind of in the middle. You know, so we're stuck on this one road and the J-STARS plane was flying and a young army uh, enlisted man was sitting there watching as it looked like on a Thursday night, what was probably an inebriated Iraqi on a motorcycle was going about 50 miles an hour, what looked like in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And so he, he cued in on it and we found out that he was actually doing about 40 miles an hour. And we found it was an unfinished roadway that was still, but the, all the bed had been put in, hadn't been paved yet. And it, uh, so presto, we found a second road. Why was that so important though? You make the point about 30 Corps at Arnhem or what most of us know as a bridge too far, the book and the movie about the, the failure and the, the heavy casualties taken by the allies. 
what is important is even if it's terrible terrain, it's almost always better to fight terrain than the enemy. And so if you give an aggressive regimental commander with an assault regiment of 6,000 sailors and Marines, you give them their own route and they don't have to just march in column behind the commander in front of them, they will find a way to get through. And sure enough, uh, that commander was a young colonel named Joe Dunford who rose to be the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, yep. and he found a way to get through. So now I had two assault regiments in the game, and the enemy is obviously on the horns of a dilemma. Does he fight against one or the other? And I've got a third regiment to reinforce whichever one has success. So that's why you always look for alternate routes. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is not your this is not your very first book. Um, you co-wrote a uh, book on counterinsurgency with uh, counterinsurgency operations, uh, I should say, with uh, with David Petras, General Petras. Um, how did that all come about? Well, Dave was the what's called the exec or the kind of the guy in charge of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Office when I was the executive secretary. In other words, working for the Secretary of Defense. Uh, basically about 50 feet away from him on the, on the next higher level of the Pentagon. So we'd known each other for a while since we were colonels. Uh, during the invasion of Iraq, I commanded 1st Marine Division. He commanded 101st Airborne. And then when we both came home from Iraq, he went to Fort Leavenworth. I went to Quantico. And these are the two locations where the Army and the Marines, respectively, write their doctrine. And all doctrine is, it's a nice big word to say, these are the lessons we learned the hard way, generally. And so what we wanted to do when we came back was update our counterinsurgency doctrine. Uh, and so we sat down and we divided up who'd write which chapters. We had coordinating groups to make sure we wrote something that stuck together. And we turned out the Army Marine coin manual that changed the way we, we do this uh, and brought forward some of the technologies, some of the understanding, the anthropology studies that taught us how do you actually do this based on historical examples uh, going back uh, a thousand years and going back to Lawrence of Arabia, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's what you owe every, every leader. It's just like the Boy Scouts when you go into a campground. You always turn it over when you leave in better shape than you found it. So our job was to turn over our respective institutions' doctrines better than we found it. So that's the story behind it. Great. Um... Out of in the book, you, you talk a lot of, about a, a lot of different things throughout your career. A lot of great stories um, that you outline in the book. But the question I want to ask you is: is is there is there something that you kind of reflect back on? Kind of something that keeps you up at night, wishing, thinking you could kind of go back and do it differently. And even more important to the, even more important add on to this question, is that something a good leader does kind of reflect upon the past? Yeah, I, I don't know how you grow as a human being unless you reflect on those things. And it's not, it's not to start weighing yourself down with all sorts of angst and regret. I mean, war is one tragedy mounted on a sad event that's uh, that the only thing worse uh, than a victory is, is a defeat, frankly, um, because of the, the tragedy of war. So you, well, you well, reflect. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, you reflect without regret and you look at where could you have done better. And I, I actually cite one case there in the book because too often we don't write about what we messed up, like my mistake of getting surrounded with my 1200 1,300 uh, sailors, Marines, and Arabs in my infantry battalion. But one time I, I landed in Afghanistan. I was under the Navy fleet control. The Navy has one way of commanding, which puts a lot of, of responsibility and a lot of emphasis on commander-to-commander -commander relations. <clears throat> the U.S. Army is, has very good staff work. <clears throat> and what I did was, uh, under Navy, I would simply tell the Admiral, here's what I'm doing. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, when I came under Army Command and Control, I didn't know my Army Commander well. He was some thousand miles away uh, in Kuwait. Excuse me. <coughs> he, 
And I didn't, I, I just wasn't as close to him because I was engaged in the operation. Now I didn't have the buildup where I was with the fleet commander as we planned the operation. We are now ashore. And basically you switch your radios from talking to the fleet commander to talking to the army commander. And I should have spent more time. I should have flown to Sam out of Afghanistan or I should have spent more time on the radio <coughs> because when the, when the intelligence came in, <clears throat> saying that we'd found Osama bin Laden somewhere in one of two valleys. I'd read about the army campaign against Geronimo, and I knew if we could cut off the border there with Pakistan and then put in outposts that meant that they could see each other so nobody could slip between them, then we could push up those two valleys, one of which uh, Osama bin Laden was in. We'd found him through ways I won't go into his location. And what I failed to do, I mean, I, I got the cold weather gear because it was in the high country. I got that off the ships and flown in. I, I had the troops briefed up. We had the reconnaissance by the Australian SAS ready to go. And then I couldn't get the orders. And then I heard that they wanted to have locals do it, which is crazy. I mean, uh, the local forces that they brought in to do it were Tajiks in a Pashtun area. They were more foreign and more more uh, disliked than the Americans. I mean, we, we were we were well liked at that point in the war. Uh, we didn't we didn't have to wear helmets or flak jackets in the villages. So we weren't once in the villages we were safe. And so, if I'd spent more time getting information up and sharing my appreciation of the situation with my commander when when they switched me from Navy command and control to Army, I think we could have cut off those escape routes in December of 2001 around Christmas, which would have made uh, made it a lot more successful a campaign earlier in taking Osama bin Laden out for what he'd done to those 3,000 innocent that he'd orchestrated murdering <clears throat> those, night for the, those, by the way, were citizens from 91 countries, those innocent people who died in New York. So yeah, that, that's where I could have done a lot better. And I, I regret to this day, I didn't do that, but you know, we live and learn. Thank you for that. Um, we'll be getting to the Q&A portion fairly quick. I've only got a couple more questions left. Uh, and my next <clears> one um, is that, you know, I've been lucky myself in, in my career, my government career, um, to work for, you know, two nonpartisan agencies, first as a Department of Defense civilian, and now as a, as a leader uh, in the National Archives. How important is it for a Marine or the military in general to be nonpartisan? Well, I, I think it's critical, uh, Joel. And here, uh, I would just point out it's just as critical that both parties uh, basically not characterize the military as belonging to them. Uh, the military belongs to we the people. There is no us and them in we the people. Uh, the American people, one of the reasons I'm doing this right now, besides just fun to support the Ford Foundation, the Ford Museum, in Michigan State. I, one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I wasn't in the Marine Corps for 40 years. I was in the US Marine Corps. I answered you. You paid my tuition for 40 years to learn this. So I owe you this, this accounting. You, you notice, you go back to Gerald Ford and, and the way he was in his talks <clears throat> to the American people. He never paraded active or retired generals. Or, or ask for their political endorsement. I mean, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even associate that sort of behavior with him. <clears throat> and yet today we have people running for office that have competing lists of generals who are endorsing them. You, you know, General Bradley said when a general or admiral retires their uniform, they should retire their tongue on partisan political issues. I think that's very good advice. Now, if asked to serve, you know, Elections are by their nature divisive, and that is absolutely critical. Our military not be seen as one side or the other in elections. When an election's over, governing requires unity. That's what governing's all about: of compromise, of working together, rolling our sleeves up, listening to each other, showing respect for each other, learning from each other, and assuming we're not always perfect ourselves. We might learn something from our fellow Americans. 
So if we start seeing the, the generals and admirals into these in partisan positions in elections, that's bad. But if asked to serve in government in the unifying effort, I think every American owes, I don't care if the president is Republican or Democrat, you owe it if asked to serve to go in. Um, and the, otherwise, the only time I'd want to see a general or admiral in an election is if they throw their hat in the ring. And that's okay if they want to run for office. That's different. Mm -hmm. uh, they're running on their own on their own merit. But I I just I think it's terrible uh, to think that we would ever have a military <clears throat> identified with one, with a political party. Thank you, uh, thank you for that uh, that answer. Um, so uh, whether it was um, Iraq, Afghanistan. CENTCOM, or even as sec uh, secretary, how important was intelligence? So when I'm referring meaning about intelligence, I mean our intelligence community and kind of driving your decision <clears throat> to be able to make the best decisions and to be able to lead. Yeah, you know, I was, uh, thanks. You, you'd actually sent me this question in advance. And I had to sit back and think about it. <clears throat> no matter what you may have heard over the last five years about our intelligence community, and it seems to me that people who contract out their thinking often want to say we have intelligence failures. I was a four-star general for six years and a secretary of defense for two years. Not once in those eight years was I surprised on a strategic or operational matter. Now you think of that. Yeah. You know, you know history, Joel. How many generals in history can say something like that? Now, tactical matters and ambush in the field. Those always happen. I understand that. <clears throat> but the intel community, I think, is the best in the, in, in the world. Our, and our intel community doesn't claim to be faultless. It never has. I mean, when you're dealing with the mysteries of, of humankind, when you're dealing with malicious people, when you're dealing with people who are out to try to outfox you, sure, they could get it wrong sometime. But I think that <clears throat> you, you've got to do your own thinking. What I used to do if I got an in intelligence piece in that then suggested something was going to happen I didn't agree with, I'd argue with the intel people. Uh, but if they didn't back off, if they were they were firm in their conviction, I used to take those kind of things out, circle them, and say I don't agree, but I want you to see this, and send it up to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense, so they actually saw the intel that I might not be promoting in my next brief to them, but I wanted them to know there was a contrary view. And it's that what you're seeing is Hegel's dialectic, the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis grow out of that. The only caution I would have is that the intel community has got to just tell you what they know and then stop the brief. And they used to do this for me because I insisted, I said, and when you start to speculate about what it means, you say, that's what we know. Now I'm gonna tell you what I think it means. And we'll speculate together. Don't mix those two up because <clears throat> if you do, you can end up thinking that something is firmly a fact when in fact, it's a supposition. And again, the Intel community doesn't claim to be perfect, faultless or anything else, no one is. And so uh, I, I would just tell you though, that uh, I have great appreciation and respect for Intel community. And I could not have made uh, the modest successes I've had uh, without them. It, it was more due to them than any brilliance on my part. So we've got, I've got two more questions left and then we're gonna get to the, uh, get to the audience. Um, just briefly on this next question, uh, just briefly. So you, you, you write something in the book that, that I, I, really, I really liked and, and this is what you write. You, you write, um, whether you are a general or a CEO, win or lose, you have to fight a false narrative or it will assuredly be accepted as fact. In the information age, you cannot retreat to your office and let the public affairs office answer the tough questions. Um, again, I, I like that. And, and could, you, could you expand on that or comment about that, uh, about that, that phrase in any way? Sure. Um, we live in the information age. And uh, decades before in World War II, Winston Churchill once commented that a lie can get faster around the world than the truth can get its pants on. 
Uh, today, I would say a lie can get 75 times around your world in milliseconds, <clears throat> and you're going to end up having to deal with it. I cannot tell you the number of times I had a plan for the day, and some somebody, some refugee from responsibility decided to say something uh, about what we were doing. I spent the rest of the day undoing the damage of that miscommunication. We don't live in an age when leaders can take be the strong, silent type. If you are, you're leaving a vacuum and you're not going to probably like a lot of the things that fill that vacuum. I'll give you an example. On one occasion, we'd been tracking and <clears throat> the foreign fighters, a team of them of about 30, uh, a little less than 30, trying to come across the Syrian border and they were being blocked by our various patrols, ours and the Iraqi army patrols. And we were ready for them. And one night, uh, I got I'd just gone to bed about midnight and I was shaken awake by my operations officer, and my intel officer, and they said they've crossed the border. They're five miles inside the border, 60 miles from the nearest city. Uh, I said, go. Uh, just as fast as I just said it right there to you, Joel. <clears throat> and, and immediately Marine F-18s went up to tankers and got a full load of gas. And Army Special Forces got on Marine helicopters and light armored reconnaissance Marines went in to seal off the area with, uh, with their vehicles. Uh, the bombers hit them, the Cobras raked them, uh, the gunships, and the Army Special Forces were on their camp and scooping up all the computers, thumb drives, everything that we had. And boy, it was a great hit, uh, got them all. And uh, the next day, uh, the enemy who's learned very well how to use our information systems, our, our social media, announced that we'd struck a, uh, a wedding party, uh, kind of a strange wedding party, uh, 28 uh, all males, military age, all with weapons and uh, explosives. Uh, so anyway, uh, so I went out and I had to talk to the press about this. And it was amazing how many were quite willing to believe this. And so we sent in an investigation team and coming out, of course, even a two-star general gets investigated for this. I mean, you know, obviously it's murder if, if that's what we did was kill a wedding party. And they asked in the course of that inquiry to me as I was sitting there, and how many hours thought did you give to this decision, general? And <clears throat> this was a piece that helped us defeat it. I said, I don't remember exactly. They, the investigators knew I'd been shaken awake and I'd given the decision in a matter of seconds. I, I think it was 28 years of thought, but I, I'll go back and check on that. In other words, you use all of the judgment you have. And as a leader, you go out front and you stand up for what's right. Don't try to, to sugarcoat it. If you made a mistake, you made a mistake, but don't apologize for it either. Mistakes happen. Get over it. We're, we're so much into apologies and assuming faultless performance by anyone under stress anymore that it, it, it's clearly being, you're being asked questions by people who've never read a history book. So you just got to keep a sense of humor. If you look at the greatest generation coming home from World War II, guys like Jerry Ford and how they talked about and didn't talk about their war, there were, there were mistakes galore in World War II, but they didn't define us. They don't define us today. So uh, I would just point out that you've got to get out front if you want to seize the narrative. And if you don't get out in front of it, you're probably going to be re uh, running a high degree of reputational risk for your corporation, your, your college, your, your city, whatever you're, you're trying to represent. If you don't get out there and fight it out in the information space, then people who don't like you are going to get out there and win the debate because you didn't show. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. My, uh, my last uh, question stems from an experience that, uh, that I still think about today. Um, I was on a C-130 heading into Baghdad. It was my first time. Um, I can't sleep on a plane. And I got to talking to this kid sitting across from me. Um, he was about 19 years old, special forces, uh, eventually going to Mosul. Uh, I was struck by him because he said something I, uh, I, I never thought, um, there was something about him I never thought I would, I, I, I've seen before, 
Um, there was a behaviorism and a stare that he had, unlike anything I've ever, ever seen before. And I thought to, was thinking to myself that, you know, as I'm sitting across from him, this kid is about literally one year away from the high school football field. And he now acts and behaves like someone who grew up really, really fast. Uh, I could tell that, I could simply just tell by looking at him that he had seen things um, uh, that maybe shouldn't be seen. Um, I often wonder, think about to this day, what happened to him? Did he make it? Did he get to go back home? Um, what I'm trying to say here, maybe, sir, Jim, um, is that, you know, war is a terrible thing. Um, and uh, I know that you probably have a thousand stories to share to probably illustrate that point. Uh, is there one more, maybe in the book, maybe not in the book, that you'd like to share with our, our audience about that? Well, you know, war, war is as ugly as it comes. <clears throat> and you'll find no one who probably hates war more than those who fought in them. Uh, I would point out that once in a war, most of us who've been there also know there is no half step. You, you have got to do the ugly things without becoming ugly. You got to do some evil things without becoming evil. And the veneer does, as I mentioned earlier, the veneer of civilization comes off. So how do you keep your balance is absolutely critical for these young men who do the actual close combat or what we call the intimate killing, the, the hand to hand in close uh, killing because anyone who thinks that the freedom that we enjoy is simply something that we can have and danger and discomfort do not have to be addressed that we're just going to have it. Well, let's just put it this way. The greatest generation came home from that war with no ambiguity about this. We had to defend ourselves. And we can talk about that greatest generation and what they did uh, afterwards. But I, I think that um, you, you've got to be able to defend this country. And whether it was George Washington's troops at Yorktown or Saratoga, whether it was uh, Abraham Lincoln's army at Shiloh, or I, I can march on through all of these, or, or Jerry Ford's Navy at Midway and Guadalcanal. Um, you're going to have to have young people who are willing to put it all on the line, who sign this blank check payable to the American people, because it's worth it. This country is worth, on its worst day, this country is worth it. And we are not a racist country. We're not a misogynist country. We have our failings. You have to look a long way to find a better country, more willing to look at its falling shorts and say, we're going to fix that. We're going to work together. We're going to fix it. Working together is critical. But I would just, <clears throat> you know, once in a while you can wonder, are we really, uh, are we really good? You know, especially when I read what passes for, uh, for history courses today in many of our colleges and the way we look at what America did wrong decade by decade. Uh, and I was, let me give you two quick stories. One, I'm having lunch with the ambassador from Australia. <clears throat> I'm a four-star, a NATO commander. And he's talking about how America made the single most self-sacrificial pledge in world history. And I think I know something about American history. He said it was after World War II. I said, oh, you mean the Marshall Plan? He said, oh, no, no. He said, the Marshall Plan just shows that America is the most unusual, most generous country in the history. He said, after winning that war, that merciless war against Nazis and fascists, as Truman put it, we whipped the fascists and welcomed the Japanese, German, and Italian people back into the community of nations. He said, the Marshall Plan just shows how generous you were. And I said, oh, you mean, you, you mean, um, the, uh, the uh, Bretton Woods, you know, where he set up this monetary thing. He says, no, no, he says IMF, uh, World Bank, that just gave hope to people, to people who otherwise would have turned to shaven head fascists to run like the trains, re, re, trains run on time. And I said, well, well what is it? What's the most single most self-sacrificial pledge in world history that I'm missing here? So after World War II, you could have looked at Europe and said, you're on your own with the Soviet Union. We are not going to defend you. That's twice in 25 years you dragged us into your war. We are not putting it up with anymore. We're going with Asia, with Latin America, with Africa. We're through with you. He said, instead, you pledged through NATO 100 million dead Americans in a nuclear war. 
to defend NATO and the democracies. It took a foreigner to teach me that. I never heard that in my history classes, that we had done that. And remember, first time NATO goes to war is when? After we get attacked on 9-11. So the greatest generation had learned it's a crummy world and like it or not, we're part of it. So let's work with the world and make it better. No more global, global depressions, no more world wars and that sort of thing. And they pulled it off. I hope we haven't forgotten that lesson. I've got another story that I'll close with, Joel, back over to you. Okay, well, uh, we're gonna get to your questions now. Um, and the uh, first uh, question comes from uh, Mr. Dalton. I'm not gonna give the whole name and I'm gonna give the, uh, the, just the last names if you don't mind. Um, it comes from Mr. Dalton. And first of all, he thanks, Mr. Dalton thanks you for your service. Um, and he is asking, uh, what is the most difficult decision you have had to make in your entire career? Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Dalton, for your kind words. And just remember that every one of you is worth it. I mean, I get thanked for my service. Believe me, everyone, I don't care if you vote Republican or Democrat. I don't care if you're male or female or, or something else nowadays. I don't care whether you're black, white, brown, or, or atheist. I don't care if you go to the mosque or the church or the synagogue or the saloon for your spiritual upbringing. Uh, you guys, every one of you, so long as you use your freedom to help each other, you're worth it. Um, the most difficult decision, you know, there was a series that I walked into when I became Secretary of Defense. Up until then, I would always kind of, you know, give my advice on how we were going to carry out military orders. But not one ship sails out of our ports, not one Air Force squadron deploys overseas or Army Brigade without the Secretary of Defense signing a deployment order, civilian control of the military. And the first week I'm there, in comes this big thick book with dozens of deployment orders for, for ships and planes and troops going to Europe, going to Australia, going to NATO, going to Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. And so I hand wrote out a card because I'm sitting there looking at it and the card was a question and I taped it to my stand-up desk. It said, does this deployment contribute sufficiently to the well-being of the American people to justify the death of these troops? Not, does it help? Not, does it, does it, is it okay to send them in harm's way? If they die, is this deployment worth it to the American people? <clears throat> so there was a whole change in how I had to look at things when I took the uniform off and came back in wearing a coat and tie as the civilian secretary of defense. But probably the single most difficult decision, and it was, it was an order, uh, but I think it carries out, Mr. Dalton, the, 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 the essence of what you're asking. Uh, in Iraq, at a very difficult time, uh, we were, in, in this case, we were under troop caps. It was 2004, we had a limited number of troops. Some people thought we were going home right away, at least people in Washington, D.C., apparently. And we, uh, we had some contractors uh, drive into Fallujah, get killed, their bodies desecrated. And I said, I got it. I said, we, we have the town. Uh, we know the tribes in there. They'll help us. We'll find who did it. We'll return the bodies to the loved ones. And we'll hunt down everybody who did it and kill every one of them. We got pictures of them off television screens and everything else. We're, we're going after them. But I do not want to attack a city with 350,000 innocent people in it and probably no more than 6,000 terrorists. Uh, make a long story short, after a couple of days, I was ordered to do it. Uh, that's why we call them orders in the military, not likes. You don't have to like it. Uh, we got orders from the, the military chain of command, supported me, wanted me to do it my way, which would uh, use the intel from the other tribes in the town, <clears throat> send in hit teams and take them out. I was ordered to assault it. So I said, okay, uh, put it in writing and don't stop me. And deep inside the city and just some bloody awful fighting in house to house fighting, uh, the enemy was running out of ammunition, frankly. And uh, I was ordered to stop, then I was ordered to negotiate, and then I had to give the order, Mr. Dalton, for the troops to pull out and turn the town back over to the very people we've been fighting, the city. <clears throat> uh, it was a very tough decision. Um, I remember a national, international news organization shoved a camera 
in the face of a young machine gunner, couldn't have been more than about 19 years old, filthy, dirty, blonde haired kid from down south, talked kind of slow. And uh, the guy, the cameraman or the news correspondent was saying, this is a terrible decision. You must feel terrible in this terrible fighting. You were, you lost some of your friends. That must be just the worst thing. And now it's terrible that you've got to pull back. And how do you feel, Marine? And the Marine looks in the camera. He has his machine gun over his shoulder. He said, it doesn't matter. We'll just hunt him down somewhere else and kill him. My point is that it was a, very difficult decision uh, to give the order to pull those assault troops out when they were closing in on the last stronghold of the enemy and hand the enemy a victory that I'd warn people don't send us in on. But you've got to do it. You, you've got to keep faith with the system. You've got to keep faith with the Constitution it says the civilians run the military. Will they get it right all the time? No, but nobody gets it right all the time. You keep faith. And if it if it wasn't for don't ask, don't tell in those days, I'd have hugged that young Lance Corporal who gave that answer and said, doesn't phase us at all. We're going back in because he had every reason to question his loyalty. And he proved that loyalty only counts when there's a hundred reasons not to be. Yeah. This next question touches kind of a little bit on, on what you you had just recently just, just talked about. And it comes from Kathleen B. Um, and she writes, uh, I am a Naval Dental Officer. Uh, there are times I have chosen to communicate what I perceive to be potential blind spots and danger spots. There have been times in my career that it appears that the chain of command is not as concerned as I am. How do you find success in communicating up the chain of command, specifically when passing blind spots? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, we, we promote officers uh, based on their proven capability to handle their responsibilities. But one thing that, uh, that you've really got to develop on your own, Catherine, is you've got to be able to have a very persuasive force of personality. Uh, and I have been in rooms uh, where my aide, as a two-star general, my first lieutenant aide, for example, uh, was uh, stopped everybody in their tracks because he knew to speak up if he saw something wrong and he would do so very succinctly. I had a Lieutenant commander, you'll remember him, Joel, my aide there at CENTCOM. Uh, and uh, he, would, he would be unhesitating in bringing something up like that. I think what you have to do is you have to recognize you're trying to, you're trying to hold an equipoise competing ideas. And if when you give the concern, your concern about the blind spot, if you start with quantification, you will probably have a better hearing than if you start with judgment. Mm -hmm. Because if you start with quantification, those things can't be refuted. And what you're trying to do here, as you try to reconcile the polarities, which is what I hear is what you're dealing with, that, that you're thinking about in your own uh, memory, when you're trying to reconcile those polarities, you need to define the problem. And whether you're a leader of 23 years old, uh, lieutenant in a room full of colonels and generals, or you're a general uh, who's a leader in a room full of civilian oversight of the military, you've got to be able to quantify and define the problem. I, I'll go to Einstein pretty smart guy, I understand. <clears throat> and he says, he was asked once, Catherine, what would, how would you compose your thinking if you had one hour to save the world? And he said, I'd spend 55 minutes defining the problem and I'd save the world in five. When Dave Petraeus and I uh, split up the chapters for the coin manual, the one chapter the Marines wanted most to write, and we got it, was the one called uh, campaign design, because it precedes all the planning. It defines the problem to what I would call a Jesuit's level of satisfaction. You really work on that, because if you don't do that, Catherine, then you may be solving the problem for them, but they don't agree on what the problem is. So if you start by quantifying the problem and get people to agree with that as succinctly as you can, then you can usually go down the right road. Because if you give the right answer to the wrong problem, 
it's still the wrong answer in everybody's mind and, and in reality. So work on defining the problem, learn how to be persuasive. If necessary, either take some debating class. You know what helped me most? Was the Marine Corps recruiting training. Because there, I would learn how to persuade people, like let my recruiters into their high school when they wanted nothing to do with them in their high school. And then when I became a NATO commander, I knew how to go forward explaining problems to allies who are independent too. So you're learning, just the fact that you're asking that question, young lady, means that you're already learning the crux of leadership. First, define the problem, define reality, and, and spend the time getting everyone on board with it. After that, you'll find the path a lot easier to overcome the blind spot. So I really like this next question, and he wants to uh, put you on the spot a little bit. It comes from Mr. Mr. Uh, Lehrer, um, and of course, having read your book, um, you know, one one can come away with a sense of that you really know history. Um, the citations that you use, the references to the uh, historical past, both our both ours and uh, other historical other histories historical past, and and he his question is, um, as a Marine. Uh, he is, uh, I am curious if you um, have a take on the greatest moment in Marine Corps history. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Mr. Lear, I'll, I'll buy you a root beer anytime I run into you. Uh, for the next seven hours, I'm going to give you the illustrious history of the Navy's private army here. I, I, you know, there's so many things that come to mind and every one of them is characterized by one thing that some very capable people who just wouldn't turn back uh, overcame every fear and they, they showed valor uh, as, uh, you know, you just, uh, Admiral Nimitz, sometimes you learn the most about your country or about your organization through other people's eyes. Admiral Nimitz looking at the battlefield at Iwo Jima said uncommon valor was a common virtue. Uh, every battle, whether it's a small fight with five Marines against five enemy on some hilltop somewhere, or it was 25,000 Marines fighting their way out of the frozen chosen reservoir, everyone is, is characterized by stories that are ingrained in our memory. Uh, in your case, Joel, you remember sitting on an airplane alongside you know, a young trooper who, who had those experiences. Uh, I would have to say Iwo Jima sums up the fighting, fighting qualities of the American fighting man. And that is certainly the emblematic battle for the Marines. And you know what it really is, Mr. Lear? It's a reminder to all the recruits, we'll never ask more of you than Marines who've gone through before and they made it, they, they, they achieved victory. So keep the faith, that's really, that's really what the uh, the greatest Marine legacy, I think, is. Got time for a couple more questions, uh, and this one uh, is uh, Mr. Spriggitz would just like to know what your uh, what was your father's occupation? Uh, my father uh, ran away to sea when he was about eighteen years old in Pennsylvania. He uh, served in the Merchant Marine from about nineteen thirty to nineteen forty seven, all the way through World War II. Uh, taking convoys from everywhere to Iran, to Australia, to Russia, uh, across to Britain, of course, and, uh, and then uh, decided he'd had enough of being away from the family that he was starting. So uh, he would engage in nuclear energy here in southeastern Washington. Um, just uh, one, of the, one of the greatest generation, one of the greatest men I know. Uh, this last question I, I, I really like, uh, and it kind of, it's, it's outward looking um, and uh, very curious as to your perspective on it, uh, Jim. Uh, it's uh, how will unmanned drones, vehicles and artificial intelligence change warfare in the future? Well, what a great question, Joel, because, <clears throat> you know, anyone who talks about the foreseeable future, I'm always reminded it is not foreseeable. Uh, you know, the, the future is going to have surprises, <clears throat> but there can be no doubt now that uh, there, we could see one, a reprimitivization of war, where <clears throat> so many of the cybernets can be taken down at one time, 
It's going to fall back onto the initiative and competence and aggressiveness of ship's captains, uh, uh, where decisions once made by generals are now being made by captains on the battlefield. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but I, I think that in the case of artificial intelligence and drone warfare, this is the first time I would say we may see a change in the fundamental nature of war. <clears throat> Why do I say that? If you go back and study war from the Trojan War onwards, the, the Peloponnesian War, if you study World War II, I don't care what war you study, what battles you study, the dominant feeling in probably most of those troops as they crossed their line of departure, as they flew their airplane against the enemy's fire, as they took their ship into harm's way, is one of fear. And you simply learn to control it, to overcome it. So my question now, if the fundamental nature of war is one of courage and cowardice, of competence and stupidity, of deceit, and duty and all of these human things put together and the, and the techniques of war, the tactics are always changing throughout history. What happens if the fundamental nature of war changes and fear is no longer in the drones or the robots and the artificial intelligence is such that they're actually learning every minute on the battlefield? I need to do more thinking about this, more studying about it right now. I'm spending more time on some other things. But I wonder if the fundamental nature of war for the first time on this planet is going to change. And if so, what are we going to do to try to stop this tragedy of war on this planet? So I don't have a good answer for you other than I think the, the I think what might happen will initially be changes on the margins, but it could change actually the fundamental essence mm -hmm. of, of warfare. And I, I don't have a good answer for you right now. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I've got uh, time for two more questions. Um, and the next one is um, from uh, Mr. Darnell. And he is uh, asking just simply, what, what is on your reading list for 2021? Yeah, Mr. Darnell, right now I've been so, you know, I, I would, I've been a, a Marine infantryman, I've been a Supreme Allied Commander, a combatant commander, you know, Secretary of Defense. And right now, as we talk this evening, I'm less concerned, at least at this point, with the Chinese Air Force bombing us, or the Russian Navy shelling us, or the Iranian Army attacking us, than I am with what's going on inside our own country. Uh, and the way we treat each other, the loss of fundamental friendliness between Americans, the trust in each other, our, our trust in the political system, our belief in the consensual underpinnings of democracy. Right now, I've got books on President Grant, not General Grant, President Grant, and how he tried to put our society back together after that terrible civil war. I'm reading Martin Luther King, many of his letters and speeches, I'm reading about Mandela and how he put South Africa back together after that hateful apartheid regime fell. And by the way, he did it with his political opponent working with him. Interesting lesson. I'm studying Mannerheim who had to put his country back together twice in his lifetime and did it in Finland, uh, survived to this day. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm studying those and trying to pull out the lessons. One of them that's come out, by the way, in my reading right now is uh, the combination of accountability for criminal acts and forgiveness as you, and how do you get that right, whether it be in South Africa or what Martin Luther King was, was proposing, uh, that sort of thing. And I'm more and more convinced that our education system is not preparing us properly and given us the background that shows how others have gotten through these times and brought things back together. Yeah. So that's where I'm studying right now. Yeah, Mannerheim is, Mannerheim is an interesting figure. I, I'm not sure uh, how many people uh, are, are aware or read uh, about Finnish history, but it is, uh, he's an extraordinarily, extraordinary fi uh, figure 
um, in, in world history. And I would encourage anybody to, to read, about, uh, read about him, uh, as well as a lot of the others that you, you have mentioned. Um, so we started with leadership, and we're going to end um, with leadership. And uh, the final question comes from uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Kearney. Um, and he writes, given your approach to leadership includes caring and empathy per your earlier discussion, uh, how, did, how did you personally handle working for leaders who did not have those qualities? Yeah, uh, number one, I'm, I'm from the West, Mr. Tierney, and I won't be trifled with, and I don't trifle with other people. <clears throat> I, I don't ask permission to care about my troops. You understand that. And what I saw myself doing in those cases was one, learning from those I didn't appreciate the way their leadership style to make sure that I wasn't doing some of the same things, maybe, maybe unaware that I was doing it. So I would look more carefully at myself uh, to tell you the truth. And, and if you look at someone like Jerry Ford who had to bring a society back together after the Nixon presidency, you see that kind of person. He was not going to take, he, he did things that he was told would doom him politically and he still did them. So I think the most important thing is do not conspire with those who would want you to change your style, but always try to be better yourself each day. I used to, before I'd go to certain meetings in Washington, DC, I got so um, concerned about my own negative attitude about some people in them that I would read Marcus Aurelius meditations. So I didn't reach across the table and slug somebody. So I'm not, I'm no perfect guy here. And I, I had to counsel myself. Um, but I, I also want you to know that um, this is a great country for learning from its mistakes. And I think if we, if everyone takes it as their responsibility to set the example, to display friendliness and respect to lead like George Washington and how he put together a revolutionary army that with French help could humble the same redcoats that would beat Napoleon a few years later. Um, th there's ways for us to stay strong on this and not to let this sort of, of corrosive rhetoric that we see every day anymore from certain uh, classes of people in this country, dare I say the political class. Um, let me, let me tell you why I've got so much faith in this. Again, I learn a lot from, from foreigners about America. Uh, I learn a whole lot from foreigners. <clears throat> I'm a two-star general, Western Iraq. We're outnumbered. This is right after we've been ordered to pull out of Fallujah. The enemy it feels the wind at their backs. The foreign fighters are trying to get in over the, the, uh, the Syrian border, being trained in Syria and the Bekaa Valley of Lebanon. If they get through the Marine outpost line across the desert, little outposts of Marines, and they get into Baghdad, a lot of innocent people are going to die. And you can see over my shoulder here, a picture of 29 sailors and Marines. Of those 29 sailors and Marines who moved me around the field, the radio operators, drivers, gunners, and in the four vehicles, 17 of those lads were killed or wounded around me in four months. And, you know, and I'm a general, I'm not in the tough fighting. This, it just, we're, we're outnumbered, it, it's not a good time. And I pull into an outpost middle of the night in the middle of nowhere in the west, out on the Western Euphrates desert. And off in the distance when the sun comes up, you can see a little green ribbon long ways away across the desert. That's the river winding its way and it's, it's, it's uh, date palms. And the lieutenant's briefing me about where he's lost men, how many enemies taken out. They're out on patrol every day fighting. He said, by the way, General, we caught a guy laying an IED, a, a mine on the road you came in on last night. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, well, that's kind of personal, Lieutenant. He said, well, he lived two years in London. He speaks perfect English. You want to talk to him? I said, really? Bring him over. And so he comes over and sits down in the dirt next to me in the dirt. And it's not a good day for him. You know, he's out there he's digging his hole the night before. He's got his two artillery rounds in a wheelbarrow. He's got his car battery. And he looks up and there's five guys with automatic weapons pointing at him. He knows he's in deep trouble. You know, his, his retirement plan has suddenly been uh, ended. <clears throat> and 
So we're sitting there and we got him a cup of coffee. He's so nervous. He's shaking it, spilling it and everything. I said, I could tell he was Sunni. I said, what are you doing this for? You know, you're Sunni. We're the Marines. We're the only friends you got in this freaking country. Why are you trying to kill us? And he said, oh, you, you Americans, you Jews, you're here to steal the oil and everything. I said, no, actually, we're not. I pull my wallet out every time I fill my car with gas, but just go away. You know, you know, you're an educated man. You're going to talk like this. I'm not going to waste my time. And a, a Marine guard stepped forward to take him away and, uh, and put his plastic handcuffs back on him. And the guy sat there for me and said, can I sit here for a minute, General? I said, sure. And so the Marine stepped back and he said, I just don't like having foreign troops in my country. Well, I can respect that. I wouldn't want him in my country either. So we talked for a little bit about his studies and what he's done. He's been forced out of Baghdad with his family due to the civil war there <clears throat> that erupted after we, uh, after we came in. And he, I asked him about his family. He had a wife and two daughters living down on the river there, about 10 kilometers away. And so we're talking and everything. And uh, I said, well, I got to get going. I got to move on to the next outpost. The sun was well up, it was getting hot. <clears throat> he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, am I going to jail? I said, oh, you bet you're, you're bippy, you're going to jail. You're lucky you're not dead right now, but you're going to be wearing an orange jumpsuit in Abu Ghraib prison for a good many years for this little stunt. But here's the message. He said, General, do you think if I'm a model prisoner, do you think my family and I can immigrate to America someday? Now, everybody, you stop and think about that. Now, here was a guy who was so filled with hate, he was literally trying to kill us. And America's power of inspiration could reach halfway around the world, and he could want to be here. On our worst day, our worst day, he would like to be living where we are right now, and his daughter is going to school right here where we are. That's a lesson we must never forget. And I think that it, as you go through and repair this country, so we turn it over like the Boy Scouts leave a campsite, better than we got it. We got a lot of work to do because the greatest generation left us in a lot better shape than we're leaving this generation if we don't get our act together and start showing a little bit of love and respect for one another in America. Back over to you, Joel. Well, thank you for a, uh, a great evening. Um, a lot to think about with a lot that you, uh, a lot you said. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that I apologize for not getting to all of your questions. There were quite a few of them um, on the situation with our pullout of Afghanistan. And, and what I'll say to this is that, you know, maybe when we're all back and working at the museum, uh, we can get the general to come back to actually come to Grand Rapids and talk to us there uh, inside the museum in our auditorium about what he believes, uh, what the, his thoughts on, the, on Afghanistan. Um, I'd like to thank General Mattis, Jim. It's an absolute pleasure to see you again. Uh, you look great. Um, actually, there was a question about exactly that, that he, how great you look and what are you doing to work out? Every morning at 4.30, folks. Every morning at 4.30 a.m. Thanks for having me, Joel. All the Thank best, everybody. Thank you very everybody. much. And I appreciate everyone. Thank you very much for Friends of Ford. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all those who watch this program. Um, and we hope to see you all very soon. Thank you.